Okay, okay, wait, wait. Yeah. So the the Honorable Minister of Finance, Arun Jaitley, Your Excellency Daniel Cablin Duncan, Prime Minister of Cote d'Ivoire, Your Excellency Kwesi Amisa Arthur, Vice President of Ghana, esteemed co-chairs and distinguished guests. On behalf of the World Economic Forum, thank you very much for joining us here in New Delhi for the India Economic Summit this year. My name is Viraj Mehta and I am the Director Head of India for the Forum. It's a privilege to be holding this meeting that brings together a truly global multi-stakeholder community to engage with India's national 16th government. Under the theme, Redefining Public-Private Cooperation for a New Beginning, we have a very exciting program over the course of the summit. A total of 24 sessions, which have been greatly inspired by the, uh, by the government's vision for India's development domestically, while positioning India on the regional and global stage. We look forward to your active engagement and contribution, and sincerely hope that these conversations will help achieve our shared goals for equitable growth in India. I would also like to thank our long-standing partner, the Confederation of Indian Industry, for our collaboration, trust, and friendship over the past 30 years. Mr. Ajay Sriram, President of CII, and Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, the Director General, for continuing this valid partnership with great enthusiasm. I thank everybody again for being here, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Chandrajit Banerjee to come and welcome everybody, please. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Confederation of Indi Indian Industries, CII, let me welcome all of you to this uh, very significant and important India Economic Summit in 2014, which is a joint effort by the World Economic Forum and CII. I said significant for two reasons. Uh, one, it is the 30, is, today is the 30th year that uh, the World Economic Forum and CII has been engaged as over the 30 years in doing this India Economic Summit. And so we do feel that this is very important. Second is we have a new government just for five plus months. And it's important. So it's happening at a time which is extremely important and critical. And we have the honor and pleasure of welcoming Sri Arun Chetli, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Defense, the Minister for Corporate Affairs, and many more other hats that he wears to have uh, 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 him amongst us to do the honors of uh, the opening plenary. We also must acknowledge the presence of um, uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, who has been a figure, he has been coming to India for the last 30 years in, in shaping this India Economic Summit so very significantly. And from CII, we would really like to acknowledge your great contribution in making this. Uh, 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 this summit to the stature that it is. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the CII president, Mr. Rajai Sriram, and other past presidents of CII who are actually seated here and who have, over the last 30 years, helped shape this very important relationship of CII with the forum and the Indian industries connect, with, uh, connect globally. The co-chairs, of course, I especially uh, uh, welcome them to, to this uh, very important uh, function. And they have been responsible for shaping the agenda for this India Economic Summit, which is so very well aligned and closely aligned with that of the government's vision and the, uh, the, go and the government's priorities, which have been enunciated over the last five, five, five months plus, be it in the area of uh, 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 be it in the area of Swachh Bharat, we, have, uh, we see uh, uh, issues of manufacturing, we see issues of uh, digital India, we see issues related to uh, financial inclusion, all these themes cutting across the India Economic Summit over the last next one and a half days. And I must say that this summit is really blessed with uh, the presence of three heads of states, and as was mentioned by Viraj, and it's an honor to really have them, the President of Rwanda, the Vice President of uh, Ghana, and the Prime Minister of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, welcome, Excellencies, for, for, being, uh, for being here and present. With that, ladies and gentlemen, once again, a very, very warm welcome to you, and wish you that you have a good, good uh, meeting over the next one and a half days. And may I now invite Professor Klaus Schwab and the Honorable Minister to please grace the, grace the dais. Thank you.
Thank you for the welcome. I have to say, for me, it's a very emotional moment because it's the 30th year of being present here in India. I was a believer in India's potential and future since many, many years, but now, finally, I think the promise which uh, India presents becomes reality under uh, your leadership, uh, the Prime Minister's leadership, and of course, I have the great pleasure and honor that we start our session, our official opening today with the presence of uh, the Honorable Arun Chetley, the Minister of Finance, Minister of uh, Corporate Affairs, and Minister of uh, Defense. Now, in preparing my, my discussions this morning, uh, I looked at all the reform processes you have undertaken, and I, I um, in my modest way, I only uh, could list until now, um, or I should say not only, I was very impressed to list uh, 19 different uh, reform processes. And I could ask you a, a question to each of those, but let me start, uh, Minister. You yourself, are you satisfied with the reform process as it has been undertaken until now? Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your invitation to the India Economic Summit. And thank you very much, CII. I've been coming to the summit in the past, yeah. but uh, I've been too long in the opposition, so we were always called for the closing session. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I do recollect that last year, I almost promised to be at the inauguration next time. <laughs> now, there's a lot which has to be done. Now, if you were to ask me, are you satisfied? Well, I'm quite satisfied with the beginning that we've made. It's a long journey. Some people expect that the second generation of reforms in India uh, really need uh, one or two big bang ideas and that probably would be about all. Reforms is not about one sensational idea. You can damage the economy by one bad idea. Retrospective taxation was a bad idea which damaged the economy. So even one such a negative step can do an immense amount of damage. But merely undoing that won't uh, cure all our problems. So we began on a journey, and I believe that uh, the pit was reasonably deep. And therefore, rectifying it is going to take a lot of time. The challenges are there. But one thing which we are bearing in mind that there are a large number of steps required. You listed 19 of them. I almost ran out of uh, paper in the morning when I was noting them. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, um, one has to consistently pursue the reforms agenda. And therefore, one has to doggedly and surely move in one direction. There are bound to be some uh, hurdles and uh, obstructions. One need not get unnecessarily upset about them. There's a lot within the present political framework uh, and the governance framework that can be done. But one thing which has to be clearly borne in mind is that uh, no step should be taken which sends a contrary signal. And therefore, with all kinds of ideas, big and small, one has to pursue one direction. And that's what the present government is trying to do. And I'm quite certain 
that it's only a matter of time when the, the ground results start reflecting on uh, the cumulative effect of these steps. I think uh, India, which had fallen off the global radar in the last uh, two to three years, people have again started looking at us. There's a considerable amount of buzz about India. People are watching very carefully. They are now get, beginning to get convinced that India would be once again a place to invest in. Those within India who were now looking outside are probably reconsidering their decision. And therefore, I think the Indian system, and that merely doesn't include the central government, it includes the state governments, it includes uh, all of us collectively, because we are living in a country which is administered uh, on the principle of cooperative federalism, we all collectively continue to pursue one positive direction. And it's only then over the next uh, few months and the initial years, I think uh, the effects within the country will also start showing. Minister, when we look at all those reforms um, from a rational point of view, I think they are in good hands with the Prime Minister and you as the principal architect. But usually when you have to reform um, whatever it is, you have to take into account the mindset. And the biggest hurdle is the mindset of the people. And of course, also in, in the case of India, as I hear, um, the systemic failure very, very often caused by crony uh, corruption. Um, would you, what is your feeling about it? Uh, how can you change? <coughs> I mean, someone told me um, if you would do a poll among the um, uh, among all uh, the people working for the government, you probably would have 10% uh, very uh, supportive, 30% uh, somewhere in between, and 60% opposed. So how can you change this mindset, and how can you um, create a corruption-free uh, society? Well, I think uh, those who administer India have first to change their mindset. And uh, if we change our mindset, we are, which we are attempting to, the last five to six months, uh, every decision which we have consistently pursued has also been intended in the direction of eliminating any possible discretion. Now let's look at the areas where charges of crony capitalism have come about in recent years. Allocation of natural resources. Now, somehow we pursued a policy which actually did say that uh, there is a huge element of discretion the government has. Once those discretions were misused and misused for cl uh, collateral reasons, you perhaps uh, uh, had those allegations of crony capitalism, some of them were actually true. The spectrum allocation, the coal block allocation, and these became defining moments against India. They became defining moments uh, and put a question mark on our entire intention uh, to honestly pursue uh, uh, reforms in the economy. If there is uh, freedom from controls, it has, there has to be an element of uh, fairness within the system which appeared to be lacking. Now look at the way we've taken some of our decisions. 
the whole mess on the coal blocks, we've almost surgically come out with uh, a new law through an ordinance, which was an emergency law in India, which has very clearly three or four aspects. There are a large number of uh, state sector companies, both at the center and the regions. So they get the first allotment of coal blocks. The actual users get it by a process of e-auction. And thereafter, if the government desires, it will open it up for commercial mining. I can tell you, with regard to other minerals, we are about to undertake a similar reform. The element of discretion in the hands of the state has almost disappeared. And therefore, once you take decisions of this kind, and governments change their mindset, eliminate the possibility of any corruption, collateral consideration, or crony capitalism, as you call it, obviously there is going to be a much larger support uh, for a reform of this kind. And therefore, investors also are certainly going to be looking for a system which is fair, not a system on which uh, they have to entirely depend on the largesse of politicians and ministers. Just to follow up uh, the issue of mindset, your, your government is very results-oriented. It's very impressive how you put results into the center. Uh, but can you, can you go as far as to make every state employee in every village really evaluated on the basis of the results he delivers? Can you go into this direction? And will you go into this direction? No, will you repeat the question? Can you make sure that every uh, government employee is evaluated on the basis of the results he is delivering? Well, I think uh, uh, that can be the target. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a very daunting target. Yeah. And therefore, you have a system of governance which uh, you can certainly improve. Can you shake it completely? It's challenging. And I think uh, the manner in which the government has started, particularly the prime minister, I've seen his interactions with the, the topmost civil servants of the country. And therefore, he's, he's started calling uh, them his team. And therefore, he knows almost each one of them by his first name. He's given them the liberty of uh, uh, SMSing or emailing or telephoning him uh, uh, for almost any consultation or information that they require. He's made himself accessible to each one of them. For instance, take this program of uh, 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 financial inclusion. It's unusual that the prime minister sent a personal letter to every bank employee in the country as a result of which, uh, 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 for financial inclusion, where 42% of India was, uh, Indian population was outside the banking system, and our target is to reach as close to the 100% mark, uh, 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 in the very first round, it appears uh, that the initial indications are that we may exceed the targets of inclusion, because the entire banking industry has actually got involved in the process of inclusion. And, uh, uh, I think uh, we could attempt that, but it's a very daunting task. You want, Minister, you want to create a plain level um, feel, uh, field for, for competitiveness. Now, uh, this includes two aspects. The first one is uh, privatization, to give uh, uh, private entrepreneurs more freeway. And second, of course, also uh, facilitating access uh, of foreign investors, um, playing a major role in the Indian industry. And here, some sectors come in mind, like insurance and so on, uh, where there are still limitations. What, what is the long-term policy which you envisage uh, in this respect? A, concerning privatization, and B, access of foreign See, investors. You see, we, 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 
we followed a slightly different model, a more liberal model, when we were in government on the last occasion. Uh, thereafter, the entire model changed. Uh, it's more a divestment uh, model. And some of the very important uh, state sector companies, the government holding is being gradually brought down, but still retained as a majority. Because some of them are very strategic sectors where it is required to be currently kept because of uh, security in those reasons, on, in those sectors of the economy. So for the present, uh, we are continuing that policy of divestment. But certainly I would be open to look at uh, 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 some set of uh, PSUs uh, which could do much better uh, in private hands. There are still a large number of them uh, uh, which are almost on the verge of closure, where people are going to lose employment. So given a choice between their continuing in the present shape or getting uh, privatized, then the second option would be a preferable option. Uh, currently, they are being sustained merely on a governmental support. Now, that's not a long-term solution. Taxpayers can't continue to pay for loss-making businesses. Uh, as far as the access to foreign investors is concerned, our policy is to look at each sector sectorally. And uh, we keep in uh, mind the requirements of the Indian economy. Uh, and uh, the, the appetite of the Indian um, uh, uh, political system uh, currently for reform in that sector. For instance, you gave the example of insurance. Now, when we were in government on the last occasion, we had uh, opened up the insurance sector. At that time, probably the political system had appetite for that limited opening up. We are now liberalizing it a little more. And uh, I do hope uh, that the amended bill uh, would be passed in the uh, forthcoming session of Parliament uh, later this month. Minister, you, you just mentioned you look at this issue, keeping in mind, I, I quote you, requirements of the Indian economy. Um, could you elaborate uh, to a certain extent what, what, what do you feel, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, foreign access? Uh, how would you define the requirements of the Indian economy? What you see, you, A, You see, for any, please bear in mind that there is a difference between reforms in a developed society. Because people in developed societies have already tasted the fruits of development. And therefore, in a country where you have 30% of the people living below the poverty line, in a country where uh, you have uh, a very large number of people at bare sustenance level, for governments to market reforms to them is far more challenging. And therefore, it's the responsibility of the government and the political system to be able to carry parliament, to be able to carry your own political parties, to be able to carry uh, a large section of the public opinion with you. So your reform process cannot be one which simply confronts public opinion or the sectors where you find a certain amount of, uh, or a huge amount of uh, uh, reluctance or reservation. Those doubts have to be cleared. That debate continuously has to go on. And therefore, you have to then weigh the requirements of each sector. There may be sectors where you open up for foreign investment, but, but you would like to keep uh, domestic equity uh, 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 at a certain level. For instance, I have recently opened up the defense sector. Now, the defense sector was always considered very sacrosanct in India, as a result of which we only became buyers. And therefore, it took a considerable amount of debate when last time we were in government, we had opened it up to the extent of 26%. Now, this time, uh, the previous government uh, had partly a view. I say partly because some in the previous government also wanted to open out. But some had a view that uh, this 26% foreign equity is enough. And therefore, there was resistance to even making it 49%. They, they couldn't make it, even though they had seriously discussed it. 
So one of my first decisions was to make it 49%. And then uh, it was accompanied by a great debate that how it helps the interests of Indian society. And by and large, I thought it's been welcome. And I can almost see the, uh, uh, the, the, the first ripple effects of this almost uh, beginning to happen. Uh, uh, I do hope uh, that India will, uh, and the private sector in India now, along with their uh, uh, joint venture partners, would get into a manufacturing of the defense equipment in India in a reasonably big manner. That's the initial indication. Minister, uh, one of the other obstacles which is always mentioned is uh, the infrastructure and infrastructure development. And when we, I will ask you later a question about uh, international uh, trade. But uh, some people would say India has to address the issue of its internal trade, which is blocked by a lack of infrastructure. Now there is a discussion also going on in the G20 how to finance long-term infrastructure projects. In, India needs a big effort in this respect. How do you want to undertake it, and how do you want to finance it? Well, in infrastructure, let me tell you, uh, uh, we welcome large uh, uh, investment participation, uh, uh, even international participation. And that is one area on which there is a much broader consensus in India. Of late, there have been financing issues. And there have been financing issues even in sectors which were earlier doing well. For instance, our national highways program, our ports program, which had been going on quite well. Uh, I think uh, of late, I have seen some financing issues. We are dealing with our own domestic uh, financial sector, the banking sector, and trying to resolve some of those issues so that uh, the financing of infrastructure can begin in a big way. But even um, uh, international participation in this sector is something which we completely welcome. And uh, for instance, uh, our railways was almost close to, uh, almost close to uh, 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 private sector investment, let alone uh, foreign investment. Uh, we've already taken our decision to open up our railways, uh, uh, at least some parts of our railways for that investment. And if the initial experiments do succeed, it will probably enable us to open a lot more. Uh, in real estate, and we need housing uh, in a big way, uh, uh, almost 60 to 65% of the people in India don't have a home uh, or a regular uh, proper home. Some have uh, homes in their villages. And uh, therefore, we need uh, uh, urbanization in a big way. We need suburbanization in a big way. This process had started. Now, we, uh, the last government has left some hurdles behind. And this is, again, another sector which we've uh, opened up for foreign investor investment, uh, because this is where capital has to come in, a, 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 in large numbers. Earlier investment, because of the restrictive norms, was confined only to the major metros. Uh, uh, we've now liberalized those norms so that we can reach the tier two, tier three cities also. Now, Minister, I would commend you on all those actions because uh, what I see in the international community, India is now at the top of the, I would say, attention list of the investors' community. Thank you. So to, to, to make sure that those, uh, this interest is as fast as possible translated into action. I think requires the necessary uh, the frameworks. And uh, here I just um, would like to refer to what you said at the very beginning. Um, you have to undo certain laws. And one of those laws, as far as I understand, is the land, um, how do you call it, land um, law? Acquisition law. Land acquisition law. And I know uh, there are many aspects, like you are not allowed to open private schools, private hospitals, and so on. Um, what, what importance do you give to this um, land acquisition law, and what will you do about it? Well, that's uh, uh, one of the more difficult areas. You see, first let me tell you, uh, 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 there's something, at least one good aspect of that law also. And that one good aspect of the law is that uh, 
a lot of land owning farmers in india and these were subsistence farmers when their land is acquired and they got a one time compensation by and large even by indian standards the compensations were inadequate and therefore this law flagged an issue of increasing quantums of compensation it also flagged the issue of uh, uh, long term relief and rehabilitation of those people i have absolutely no quarrel with that uh, part of the law and i think uh, that part of the law must remain uh, the one which poses a difficult challenge is that procedurally the law lays down a very complicated procedure for acquisition of land now conceptually acquisition of land was always a sovereign power it was a sovereign right or eminent domain as they called it because in any society uh, uh, from building a a defense uh, uh, containment uh, or an installation uh, to building a school to building a highway to uh, building a graveyard for anything you needed land and therefore if uh, acquisition of land was made complicated almost impossible then the growth process itself uh, uh, gets stalled and this law has made it uh, 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 extremely comp uh, complicated now the previous government thought that perhaps this law because it made it very complicated with the, a section of the population would be extremely popular and it could be a, uh, a vote fetching device now that doesn't seem to have happened now that uh, that conclusion has been established i think time has come at least at the second part of this law to have a, a relook and there are areas uh, once you get functioning i today in the newspapers read uh, a statement of one of the state government ministers belonging to the congress party uh, in one of the states who said uh, the difficulties they are facing i can tell you as a defense minister i am facing a difficulty every day where even defense and national security is not an exempted purpose mm -hmm. so you have to go through for a regular acquisition that complicated process uh, today rural infrastructure urban infrastructure uh, industrial corridors industrial parks affordable housing housing for the poor now even for these purposes for which land is required and these are essential purposes you you you, you don't get land and then there are some illogical provisions like the one you mentioned that land cannot be used uh, or acquired uh, under this law uh, for private educational institutions or private hospitals so if andhra pradesh is today going to set up a new capital uh, he'll have to first make sure in the land he acquire it acquires that there is no school or hospital in it because the moment they did it uh, i i think uh, the gentleman who drafted this must be he asked to explain the rationale behind a provision of this kind Uh, so if we are planning to set up 100 smart cities they have to be without uh, uh, a private hospital or a private school or a private university uh, or even a hotel because it says it it bars three purposes private educational institutions private uh, hospitals and uh, hotels uh, so uh, there are some factors in it which i think certainly require a relook minister i i i would like to ask you more international question uh, india uh, counts for 23% of global population but only 2% of global trade now india should have a special interest in facilitating um, global trade relations now coming from geneva uh, and looking at the uh, wto negotiations um india is uh, put on the accuse and uh, on the um, let's say is accused of being a stumbling block as you know and uh, one of the parts in the in the present uh, negotiation is trade facilitation and we the forum published a report and i think you were on 93rd uh, country in terms of uh, trade facilitations Uh, would you would you express your own uh, opinion how can india what is the reason wh which helps india back uh, to to come well to india is certainly not opposed to trade facilitation let me make it clear yeah now even if there was no wto 
for our own reasons, we would be facilitating trade and having therefore the best infrastructure for that. Mm -hmm. Now, our trade facilitation commitment is not because of any multilateral arrangement at the WTO. It's a commitment as a developing economy which we owe to ourselves and therefore we are going to have trade facilitation. Now, India's position on trade facilitation has been completely misunderstood because of an unreasonable positioning by some of the developed countries. And that unreasonable positioning is the following. As a part of the Bali arrangement, what is sought to be pushed through is trade facilitation, one, and two, a permanent solution being found to stock holdings in agriculture and food grain. Now, India has a very large uh, food procurement program where a state agency procures food from the farmers. Today's newspaper headlines tell us how the international prices have fallen. And uh, if food grain prices collapse, and India is not able to subsidize its farmers to that extent. Now, most of the subsidies as far as the uh, United States and the European Union have con are concerned, from the amber box and the blue box have moved to the green box now. The quantum has increased, it hasn't come down. Now, obviously, therefore, our, the state has to buy the food grain from the farmers, and that food grain as a part of our food program, we have a legislative uh, support to that food program, is now distributed to poor people in India. That's our food program. Now, there is sought to be a permanent arrangement on restricting the extent of food stock holdings, which, if it is reduced, would result in Indian government not being able to buy from its own farmers and food grain from elsewhere coming in, increasing the number of suicides which our farmers in India are being compelled because of indebtedness to commit. Therefore, Indian state, Indian government owes it to its farmers to protect their interests. Now, we are negotiating the, the food stock holdings arrangement, which is sought to be calculated on the prices of 1987, 86-87, which itself appears to be unreasonable. But then the controversy is only about one clause, and that one clause is, we agree to trade facilitation. The arrangement on food stock holdings is arrived at. It may take a much longer time to arrive at that arrangement. But the peace clause and the impact of the peace clause in simple language is that if India doesn't restrict its food stock holdings, it will be taken to the dispute mechanism at the WTO. The peace clause would vanish in four years. Now, all that we have requested is the settlement of the dispute with regard to the food stock holding and the peace clause must continue to coexist. Therefore, till you resolve that issue, India should not be taken to the dispute redressal mechanism. The peace clause must coexist. So the dispute is not with regard to trade facilitation. Trade facilitation has become a mere victim because of this unreasonable posturing uh, by some countries that your peace clause will disappear in four years, but the decision on the food stock holding can take place uh, indefinitely. When I have discussed it with the representatives uh, of very large economies, uh, uh, they were, in fact, surprised uh, uh, that India's position appears to be very reasonable because we agree immediately to trade facilitation. Please agree to the peace clause coexisting with the settlement of the dispute. That's all. But this is being positioned as a, some kind of an ideological opposition to trade facilitation, which there is none. So even if there was no WTO, we probably would be doing trade facilitation within India. We are agreeing to a multilateral arrangement on trade facilitation. But please keep the peace clause alive. 
till the dispute is settled with regard to the stock holdings issue. That's all. Thank you. I think it's uh, very, un uh, very uh, can be very well understood. Uh, I hope that in uh, you take our report uh, of trade facilitation, which lists all the different issues as a kind of benchmarking uh, to improve in the future. But remaining to a, a, uh, with a similar issue, um, the whole subsidies question. Um, I think it's about 2% of uh, GDP which the government spends for subsidies. Um, what is your feeling? Can you reduce those subsidies? Um, well, we are know? already in the proce process of rationalizing them. For instance, uh, 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 petrol is already linked to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the prices of the crude. We've taken a decision two weeks ago linking uh, diesel to the market right. price. I have already appointed as a part of my budget announcements uh, the Expenditure Management Commission. Uh, the Expenditure Management Commission um, may give some interim recommendations. And uh, rationalization of subsidies is uh, uh, one of the autumn, uh, important uh, items that they have to suggest. And uh, I'm quite certain that uh, they will come out with some important uh, suggestions to that effect. Uh, do I see subsidies in India being eliminated? The answer is no, because there is a section of people which will still require element of support as far as food is concerned uh, uh, and so on. But do I see it as being rationalized? I certainly do. Minister, we, we have to come to an end of uh, our discussion, but I have two, two final questions. One is uh, of an economic nature, and I know many of our members uh, would ask this question, uh, how can you um, reform the labor law to facilitate particularly the employment of young people? Um, now you have to boost the manufacturing sector. What, what, what are your plans in this respect? See, let me tell you, uh, today's one of today, uh, the newspapers today carries a comment uh, from me that reforms are an art of the possible. You don't take up the more difficult reform in the first instance, and then keep campaigning that I'm not being allowed to do it. Therefore, there are a hundred things which are possible in India today as a part of the reform process. Some aspects of the labor law in India can certainly be improved and rationalized. In fact, uh, the initial three amendments, and I'll simply say they are not very radical uh, changes, uh, are, are, are something which we've uh, already discussed. Some of them have been introduced in Parliament, are due for discussion in Parliament uh, in one of the forthcoming sessions. And this is an area where we will have to have much larger consideration, even with people working in that sector. And uh, currently, uh, uh, I think that it's about time that process started. But will that happen immediately? I'm unable to say that as far as the passage is concerned, because uh, some people will certainly have reservations on that issue. Uh, will I be able to immediately get it passed in Parliament? I'm not in a position to comment. Uh, I see merit in your suggestion. But then there are many others within the political system who still don't see merit in that suggestion itself. So we have to convince all of them uh, uh, that perhaps a more flexible policy will create more jobs and is more uh, uh, labor friendly. But that's a process in which uh, I think uh, a, f a much larger debate in India is required. But you foresee this process uh, taking place and hopefully coming to a positive end still during this legislature? No, th this requires a legislative change, and therefore uh, we have to prepare our legislature uh, uh, for a change of this kind. But still in the coming, I mean, under the present um, government, about you see the, the next elections, let's put it No, I, I won't, I am unable to bind myself to any time, 
but there are changes which are more reasonably plausible, as I said. Uh, three of those changes, uh, our government has already decided, the cabinet has passed them, some of them are already before the parliament, and they are being discussed. Now, the last question, Minister, I, I ask you in your capacity as Minister of Defense. I think the world welcomed um, the opening up of relations with Pakistan. Uh, now there have been some incidents lately. Uh, you made some comments. Um, how do you see the evolution of your relationship uh, with uh, your closest neighbor, if I may say so? or most important neighbor, Pakistan? Well, it's a very important question that you've asked. Uh, the answer to that uh, really, it depends on how Pakistan chooses to answer that question. <laughs> you see, the present government sent a clear signal in the first instance that we were willing to speak to Pakistan. We were willing to normalize our relationship with Pakistan. We invited the head of government, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, to India at the swearing in of the government itself, which was a very important signal. The two prime ministers met, they discussed. It's never the government of India stand that we are not going to speak to Pakistan. But at what level you speak and when do you speak, the environment for that dialogue and the level at which the dialogue takes place has to be entirely set by Pakistan. But then there are a few red lines. So we invite them. We create the environment. We then fix up a dialogue at the level of the foreign secretaries. Our foreign secretary is to visit Pakistan literally a few hours before that, they invite the separatists for a dialogue uh, to their High Commission. So I think a new red line had to be drawn in Pakistan uh, to reconsider this question, that who do they want to speak to? They want to speak to the government of India or they, do they want to speak to those who want to break India? So unless Pakistan makes that conscious choice, uh, a meaningful dialogue with Pakistan would not be possible. And then came the third stage, where uh, hostilities are mounted uh, at the international border and the li line of control. Now, traditionally, when uh, such hostilities are mounted, uh, we've been defending ourselves. But we did consider, and that's the statement I made, that Pakistan also must realize uh, that this kind of a misadventure where you fire on civilian population, start killing civilian population, uproot Indian villages at the line of control or the international border, probably the consequences of all this would be an unaffordable cost for Pakistan. And therefore, each one of our three actions so far has a message. The first is we want to talk, so we invited them. The second is we send our foreign secretary there. But then you must decide uh, whether to speak to a foreign secretary or to speak to those who want to break India. And the third is that this kind of a situation on the Indian international border can't go on. That there's a daily tension. That's not an environment for a dialogue. And therefore, India would like to normalize the relationship. But uh, whether Pakistan wants to normalize the relationship, it depends on uh, Pakistan. Now, I can quite understand Pakistan's problem is uh, who decides these things in Pakistan, the civilian government or somebody else? Mm -hmm. Minister, I think this session, I'm, which uh, in half an hour, we, you answered, uh, you gave a precise answer to so many questions. Uh, I think it just shows the new tone and uh, the new mode of um, uh, the government of the country. Uh, it's based on efficiency. Uh, it's based on a comprehensive policy. You, I quote you, you said the reforms are the art of the possible, um, but um, behind, let's say, you have a vision for the long term. And um, I would conclude this session just by asking you a very final question. If you had one message 
particularly to the foreign um, CEOs who are sitting in the room, or I, may, or I may subdivide the question. If you had one message for the foreign CEOs in the room, what would it be? And if you have one message for the Indian CEOs who are in the room, what would it be? Message well, or request, I should say request. Well, I have one message for both of them. We are waiting for you. <laughs> And I think we should, uh, we should go through the open door. Let's, put, let's uh, conclude the session uh, in this spirit. I, I, I know, Minister, probably we can count on your presence in, in uh, Davos next year. I'm sure you will have an opportunity to talk about further progress. And for all your reform attempts, um, we wish you and the Prime Minister good luck and the necessary support. Thank you.